it's okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for your prayers. Um, before I forget, um, I do have a card <laughs> for you, <laughs> a thank you card from us, and I will explain it a bit more later, and I will bring you an update of the work and even the prayer requests that uh, we had last month. But before, I would like to share some thoughts with you from the Word of God, and after that, if the time allows, uh, I will speak more about the work. And um, as we were fellowshipping, <laughs> um, we talked about a number of subjects, right? <laughs> and uh, I thought for a while that, well, the subject that the Lord burdened my heart with for tonight, we, all, we almost talked about all of it in the fellowship time. Uh, and that subject is the faith of God's elect. That is the, the subject that I would want to speak to you tonight about. And uh, let's open our Bibles to Titus. And in the very introduction, the very first verse there, um, Paul addresses his letter to his co-worker Titus, who was sent to Dalmatia, which is today's Croatia, not very far from Romania about six hours of driving. And uh, Paul says, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness. So there we have the phrase, the faith of God's elect. Uh, well, what is faith? I would like tonight to kind of look into what faith is and what it does, the necessity of faith, and the difference between the natural faith that all men have and the God-given faith, the faith of God's elect. In Hebrews 11.1, 1, we have there the most used verse as... Um, sort of a definition of faith. And there we find that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Uh, we learn that faith is a total confidence, is a trust, it's loyalty, it's fidelity. Actually, the word fidelity comes from fide, which means faith in uh, Latin. And in the Greek word, in the Greek word pistis, it's the same for loyalty, for faithfulness, and for faith. So they're connected. So it's a loyalty and fidelity in the object of our faith. It is um, a mental, intellectual acknowledgement of some statements, but it is more than that. It is an inward trust in the one who makes those statements, which, inv which involve, um, it's a trust that causes us to be loyal to him. So faith implies, and it's always connected to relationship to the one in whom we believe. So it's not something abstract, it's not something in vacuum kind of an environment. It is trusting absolute trust in the one who makes the statements that we acknowledge to be true. Uh, what is the purpose of faith? Many people consider that faith is their response, their contribution to salvation. Whether they admit it's a work or not, they will say that it is my faith that will cause the Spirit of God to regenerate me. But this is wrong. We have a saying, to put the, to put the cart before the horses. <laughs> because faith is not the cause of regeneration, but the effect yes. of regeneration. And it's really important. Years ago, when I made a mission trip, probably the first mission trip to Bucharest, I met a man there, and he asked me, he said, can you please arrange in a logical 
order these four things for me. And he said, repentance, salvation, regeneration, faith. Okay, so he intentionally uh, mixed up the order and he wanted me to uh, arrange them. So I thought, I thought about it. Now this is like back in 2004. And I thought, and never, no one asked me to do that before. But I thought, well, regeneration must come first. And then it's repentance. Repentance is a turning from our past life, from sin, from the world, unto something, unto someone, unto Christ. Uh, faith is, it is the evidence of the things that we don't see with these eyes. But we see with spiritual eyes. So when God regenerates us, it's like he opens our eyes to a whole new world. And it's something that we just cannot produce ourselves. Well, so what is faith? Faith is, not a, con faith is a condition of salvation. No one is saved. No one believer is saved. Right? So it is a condition of salvation, but it's not the cause of salvation. It is the means. By, by grace we are saved through faith. And that faith is not of ourselves, but it is the gift of God. I hope I quoted right in English. I'm actually translating from Romanian. <laughs> I'm more used with the Romanian uh, version. Uh, so, faith is not of ourselves. It is given to us. And actually we have several verses that speak of faith as something that is given. It is the gift of God. We, we have, besides, Roman, uh, be, besides Ephesians 2, 8 to 9, we have Philippians 1, 29. And there Paul says, For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on Him, but also to suffer for His sake. So it is a grace to suffer for Christ. Can we do it? Can we uh, be faithful in times of persecution? Well, we know that for, for special situations, there is special grace. Yes. It is special grace. But it's not only a grace to suffer for Him. It's a grace to, it is given to us to believe on Him. Right? Second Peter 1.1, 1, 1, you know, the elect that obtained the faith that is as precious as, those, as the one of the apostles. Like precious faith. It's not in us. We obtained it. So all these verses talk about the faith as something that is given to men, not something that is in every man and just needs to be activated. One uh, preacher in Romania put it this way once. He said, trying to illustrate the faith, it said, uh, and you don't have uh, fuses here anymore, right? You have breakers. But he gave the illustration of fuses. We still had fuses back then. And he said, see, you know, faith is like a fuse. You know, all men have, you know, this fuse. But if you want light in this room, you have to put your fuse in the right place. Right? So if, to some people, it made sense. You know, to me, it didn't. <laughs> because first, not all men have fuse, <laughs> says Paul. <laughs> not all men have faith. So it's like people are without fuse. You know, you may, you don't have something to put into the proper place to have light. It's not in us. Faith is given to us. Uh, but what, can't men believe? In, in God and, and respond to the gospel without God giving them faith, without Him intervening first? No. But why not? Why not? Think about it. Man is a believer by nature. And if you don't believe me, <laughs> it still makes you a believer. Uh, atheists. Atheism is a belief system. You know, they say, we don't believe in God. Well, it's a negative statement, but it's a belief system. The universal spread of religion proves that man is a believer by nature. 
I mean, even exact sciences, even empiric sciences are based on faith in their starting premises. Like geometry, you don't think that you know, you'd need faith you know, to study geometry, but you need faith in their axioms, which are evident truths, but you just cannot prove. You know? So man is a believer by nature, and I think this is important to understand. So that kind of faith all men have. But God speaks about the faith of God's elect, about the true faith, saving faith, being given to us, being the gift of God. Now, why is it that our natural faith is not good enough to save anyone? When we admit that man is a believer by nature, and then we see that kind of faith is not good enough to save anyone. God has to intervene to give the gift of faith, of saving faith. Then we should ask ourselves, why is it that natural faith is not good enough to save anyone? Because, and it's a really important question, because we have many people out there, many people that call themselves Christians, many people that call themselves born-again believers, that are lost. Well, what is the difference? If you ask them, they believe in Jesus Christ, they can repeat you know, the gospel, but they're still lost. Because you can exercise a natural faith in Christ or in the facts of the gospel. But if it's just natural faith, you're still lost. Only God-given faith brings a, uh, saves anyone. Only God-given faith. So, why is it that natural faith cannot save anyone? First, because man in its natural state is an enemy to God. Yes. In Romans 8, 7, we read that the flesh, the, our sinful nature, is enmity. It's enmity itself, not just an enemy, it's enmity against God. And cannot subject itself to God. It hates God so much. The natural man would never accept what God says. So, in his natural belief system, man will never reach truth because of his own sinfulness and blindness to everything that God says and rebellion to everything that God says. Well, secondly, in, uh, second, in 1 Corinthians 2.14, we read that man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. Why? Because they are foolishness to him. So he, he does not receive them, and he cannot receive them because they have to be discerned spiritually. But for, he, for, for him, they are Foolishness. The message of the gospel is nonsense, is fairy tale, is unfair, is foolishness. So man by his nature will not believe the gospel of the grace of God. And thirdly, because man is spiritually dead. Dead in trespasses and sins. Every time I attend a funeral or I preach a funeral, you know, when I have the chance to preach one, I make a point that preaching the gospel is like preaching to the person there in the coffin. And man in their natural state has as much ability to answer, to respond to the gospel as that person there in front of me. That is spiritual, spiritual death. It is total separation from the life of God. Men cannot respond because they are dead. I have a relative in Romania who is a Baptist preacher, Union preacher. He's rank Armenian, and he was preaching a funeral of a relative of ours. So he, he, he gave the example, trying to make an invitation. He said, it's like you receive a phone call from a bank, and you inherited this big sum of money. I, don't, I didn't think it was a really happy illustration when our aunt 
you know, passed away. <laughs> but that's the illustration he chose. So I said, like, you received a, a phone call from a bank. And all you need to do is to go there to the bank to, to, in, to get into the possession of the money. And, and he just couldn't help it. And he said, you must be stupid not to do that. Well, you know, I felt pity for him. Our listeners, those that hear our, our gospel, they're not stupid. Many, I thought many here are smarter than you. You know, they're not stupid. They're not ignorant. They are dead. You know, that's the proper word. They're not just sick. They're dead. Amen. So the natural man, with all his belief system, he cannot and will not accept God's message. He would accept anything else but what God says. He would accept any recipe for salvation. You tell them they have to go to Mecca, they would go to Mecca. You tell, you tell them, and in Romania, you know, the Eastern Orthodox, they have a work, clearly work-based salvation. You have to go into pilgrimages. You have to climb stairs on your knees. You have to do all kinds of things like that in order for you. Maybe God will show you grace. They don't give you assurance. And I'm kind of thankful for that. <laughs> you know. But man would do anything but believe God. And why is that? He wants to have a merit. He wants to have a merit in his own salvation. Now, it can be just 1%. It doesn't have to be 50-50. I mean, 1 to 99. But still, he wants to have a merit there. And, and the message of grace is that we have no merit. By grace are we saved through faith and that not of ourselves. Why? So that no one will boast. Because merit equals it will result into boasting. So the natural faith is not good enough to save anyone because man in his natural state is the enemy of God because he's spiritually dead, because he considers the message as foolishness and he cannot receive it, and also because faith, God-given faith, is connected to repentance. And natural man absolutely abhors that word. Because it means a turning, a complete change of mind. It's a 180 degree turning, which means to leave behind everything that you loved. And man just is not ready to do that. I mean, when you talk about even a 90% turning, yeah, we might negotiate some. I may leave some, you know, some things behind. But everything? No way. Faith is connected with repentance, a complete change of mind, a total surrender to God, an unconditional surrender to God. And man is his enemy. Our flesh is enmity with God. They're not gonna, our flesh is not gonna surrender without a fight. <laughs> What are the differences between the natural faith and God-given faith? In other words, what is it that makes me, one of God's elect, better than others who have natural faith? What is it that makes me better? I might say, I'm ready to die for my faith. Now, if I'm not ready to die for my faith, I have a problem. But I may say, I'm ready to die for my faith. I would not recant. I would, I would die for my Lord. But people that have natural faith, they can die for their faith too. Think about all the people that blow themselves up thinking that they will inherit a heaven full of virgins. Now, that's a pretty strong faith. You know, they will end their life just like that. Because they believe strongly. You know, many of our forefathers died for our faith to come to us. It's a privilege to be part of our kind of churches. But you know, the wrong side has martyrs too. The Catholics and the Orthodox, they have their martyrs too. 
So what is it that makes us different? Well, the things that we believe. You know, our teachings, our doctrines and practices. And it is true that our doctrines and practices sets us, set us apart from any other man-made organization. But let me tell you something. That if only if we're different than other people just considering the doctrinal aspects, that's the very minimum. We have to be superior. We have the faith of God's elect. And if it's just the doctrinal part that sets us apart, we're not in a good shape. It should be much, much more than that. It starts there. So uh, let's look at the differences between the natural faith that lost people have and the saving God and the, and the faith that brings us salvation that uh, God gives. Well, first of all, the object of saving faith is the God of the Bible. We believe in the God of the Bible. We read in Romans 8, 28, that all things work together for good to them that love God. What God? The God of the Bible. Now, many people are willing to love certain aspects of the God of the Bible, like his love, his kindness, his goodness to all people. But when you come to his justice, when you come to his holiness, when you come to his sovereignty, I've heard people saying, I cannot love a God who predestinates only some to heaven. That God, I cannot love such a God. Well, that's the God of the Bible. You cannot pick and choose what traits to love from him. If you don't love him altogether, if you don't see him altogether lovable, you don't have that faith. I mean, we're called not to know Christ after the world, you know, or as the world. When we we're born again, everything becomes new. We're a new creature. And we do not see Christ like we've seen him before. The object of saving faith is the God of the Bible. The, the natural man will worship anyone but this God. You know, he would believe anything but what God want, wants him to believe, what God revealed in his word. This is why God has to intervene to give anyone that might be saved the faith of God's elect. If he hadn't intervened, none of us would be saved. There would be no human being in heaven if he hadn't intervened, if he hadn't elected some and predestinated some to be conformed to the image of his son. You know, people talk about justice. You know, God is not just if he doesn't offer you know, all people an equal chance. Well, guess what? He doesn't. It's a fact. We are, there's only one means, one way to be saved. Through a person, Jesus Christ. If you haven't heard the gospel, if you haven't heard about Jesus Christ, you didn't receive a chance. In quotes, a chance. You know, what if you were to be born the same day? And I challenge many people in the States. I suppose all of you were born in the States, right? What if you were to be born the same day, the same month, the same place, but 600 years ago. Would you have heard the gospel? You know, it's no coincidence that we were born and all his elect are born in a place and time when they are brought in contact with the gospel. Because the gospel is the instrument that the Spirit uses in bringing about regeneration. And no one is saved apart from the gospel, outside the presence of the gospel. So, the object of the saving faith is the God of the Bible. Secondly, when we look at the quality of faith, saving faith is an inward trust that involve a, involves a relationship with the one in whom you believe. A relationship means a daily walk. 
it's a personal relationship. You know, many people, they can acknowledge certain doctrines. It can be the you know, right doctrines, but for them it's just mental, a mental acknowledgement. You know, I have, um, I acknowledge the multiplication table to be true, but I have no relationship with the multiplication table. And it's so with some people that they believe some mentally, some statements, some doctrinal statements, but they have no relationship with God who made those statements. And that's not saving faith. Saving faith in respect to its quality is based on a relationship with the God of the Bible. Thirdly, saving faith is connected with repentance that is so repugnant to the natural man. Again, what is repentance? God commands all men that hear the gospel, all men, everywhere, to repent. Well, what is that? What does he expect? What, what is the duty? Well, it is a complete change of mind, of attitude, of worldview, if, we, if you wish. Right? So, faith is always connected with repentance. They are twin gifts. Just like faith is the gift of God, repentance is, is described as being given by God. In regard to the evolution in time, the, that faith that is God-given does not diminish in its quality, but grows deeper and deeper the more we experience God. And it's like... That process is compared in the Bible with the growth from infancy to adulthood, to maturity. Uh, natural faith is always oscillating. It's dependent upon certain moods and feelings. It can be worked up, even in, re- I mean, most of the time in religious circles and, and assemblies. You have a revival, and you can see people that are thrilled and enthusiastic, and yes, they're saved, and they want to serve God, and, you know, and then you see that there's nothing there. You know, it's it's like, um, I imagine, uh, uh, like a spiritual defibrillator. You know, you can jerk some action into them. You know, you can see some heart movement, kind of erratic, but, you know, you can see some, uh, you know, activity there, but it's no life. There are many religious people that are like that. And I'm afraid there are people in our churches that only had a mental faith, but not the transforming faith that is long-lasting, that grows deeper every day. Is the saving faith the answer of the natural man to the call of the gospel? No, it is not. The natural man has a disposition toward religion, has a natural faith in itself, but that faith is not sufficient to determine a sinner to embrace the God of the Bible and his way of salvation. When someone repents and believes, this is due to God's intervention in their life, bringing them to light, bringing them to life. So, let's make really quickly some applications. How can I know if I have the faith of God's elect. I've had uh, people in Romania, one of them I think in particular, he, he was terrified that he, he wants to believe, he wants to serve God, but he can't because he's not of one of his elect. And so he says, I mean, this guy was sure that he was not, uh, you know, one of his elect. And his wife was desperate. She didn't know what to do with him. I mean, ever since he thought he understood election, you know, he was like, you know, he didn't want to have anything to do with anyone, and he's terrified at God, and, you know, all his life was changed in a bad way. So I asked him, 
I, do you believe that God exists? And he said, yes, of course, you know, and he's just waiting for the judgment. And I said, well, are you happy that God exists? Well, he never thought about that. Well, are you happy that God is? Well, yeah. Well, <laughs> only the elect are happy that God exists. <laughs> right? When you understand who he is, you know, there's no reason to be happy if you're lost. And we know, beloved, your election of God. You know, you can know that you are one of his elect. So how can I know? Well, when I look at my faith, when I look at what I experience and my trust in the Lord, you know, when we look at the faith described in the Bible, we find that first, an understand faith consists of an understanding of the message of salvation, and then a re recognition of the message to be true, and then an absolute trust in those statements, and faithfulness or loyalty to the one to whom those statements refer. All these three parts are absolute essentials to saving faith. Understanding the message. This is so important because a wrong message will not produce salvation. A gospel that preaches works. A gospel that preaches the man's power to, to um, bring about regeneration and to put himself in a proper relationship with God. That is not the gospel that will bring forth salvation. Now, Christ can, God can save people in spite of some, some techniques and messages that people use. He saved me when I grew up in an Armenian church, but he saved me through reading the Bible, in spite of everything that I was taught. So, you know, the Spirit, he, just like the wind, you know, you cannot control it. Uh, it is important to understand the message. A wrong message will not bring about salvation. Belief in the wrong God. You can believe as strong as you want. But if you believe in the wrong God, there's no salvation in there. Amen. The absence of a message will not produce regeneration, will not produce salvation. How can they believe if they don't hear? And we can sit back and relax and say, well, God is going to save his elect even if I don't go there to preach. That's the wrong attitude. We have to go. We have to be busy going. We're not going to save anyone. We're not going to add to the number of the elect. But God chose this foolishness of the preaching of the gospel to be the instrument that brings salvation to his elect. It is the instrument. God chooses the end, but He chooses all the means to reach that end. So, understanding the message. Secondly, recognizing the truthfulness of the message. Whenever the gospel is preached, it divides hearers into two classes. I'm not talking about those that don't hear it. I'm talking about those that hear the gospel. There are only two possible answers to the call of the gospel. You either believe it and embrace it and surrender to it, or you reject it. There are only two classes. Some people say, well, I'm kind of an, on a neutral position. No, you're not. Your neutral position is actually reje rejecting the gospel. So the second part of, of the faith of God's elect, after understanding the message, understanding the need for salvation, my sinfulness, and what the fact that I cannot save myself, the fact that I stand condemned before God, that's part of understanding. And by the way, the gospel is the good news, but it, it always starts with the bad news. If we don't preach the sinfulness, if we don't preach the condemnation, people will not appreciate the good news. So it's important to have the whole view, the whole picture in view. Thirdly, so after understanding the message and trusting, recognizing the truthfulness of it, saving faith is um, something living, something that produces fruits, something that produces a relationship 
with God. You know, mere intellectual agreement with some statements is not enough. And if our faith stops there, you know, it's not the faith of God's elect. Saving faith is not merely an un, you know, understanding or in, an intellectual agreement with some doctrines. D demons believe and tremble, says James. So he, he challenges his hearers. Show me your faith without works. And I will show you my faith. How? Based or from my works. That's the living faith. That's a faith that places me in a relationship with God. When I understand that, my life is changed. My life is changed. And by every day, I am changed more and more. And I'm conformed. I'm conformed to the image of His Son. And that is the very purpose of my existence. I was predestinated for that. You know, that's living faith. So, I want to challenge every one of you to ask ourselves, I challenge myself, what kind of faith do I have? Just agreeing with the right doctrines does not save you. Just acknowledging facts about Jesus that He's the Son of God, that He lived 2,000 years ago, that He died and He was buried and He resurrected. Just acknowledging those as just facts does not save us. Unless we have that God-wrought faith in us that's always in connection with repentance. Abandoning our self. Abandoning our self-righteousness. Abandoning our merits. Abandoning our old views of God and of Christ. And embracing Him as He is. And casting ourselves to His feet. Totally and unconditionally surrendering, surrendering to Him. Unless we experience that, we have not experienced the faith of God's elect. So, to those that have not experienced that, I encourage them to come to Christ, to come to God. He is the author. He is the finisher of our faith. In our own strength and ability and power, we're no better than the men who cried to Jesus, that Father, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. If we have the faith of God's elect, if God gave us that gift, that faith is a living faith. It lives in us, through us. I mean, day after day, it produces works. It has effects. It makes us holy. Both in our, both our, in our personal lives and in our church life. It makes us holy, because holy, holiness becometh thine house, O Lord, forever. It is befitting His temple, both as a congregation, as an individual, because we are the temples of the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit is holy, so should we be. We should grow and persevere unto holiness in our everyday life. If, if our everyday life does not express that kind of holiness. And what is holiness? Separation. That's what it is. It's, it's separation from something, from the world, from sin, from the values of this world, unto something else, unto service of God. And one of the things that I'm concerned about, our churches, is lack of separation. It seems like many of us are satisfied with just being a little better than the world. But the world is not our standard in our race. You know, we're not, we should not run our race just looking over our shoulder and being satisfied that we're a bit better than the average, than the society. Because society is not our standard. It is Christ that is our standard. It is His, His word that is our standard. And, and it's the same 
for all generations, wherever we are. You know, cultures differ, and we're, we're affected by our environment, whether we admit it or not. We live in our society, but we should not take the society as a standard. It is Christ that is our standard, because we are predestinated to be conformed to his image. So the faith of God's elect will produce the works in us that will, as we grow in our experiences with God, we will be more and more separated from the values of this world and be more and more likened and or like our older brother because he is the firstborn among many brethren. So our prayers as a church in Romania, as a sister church, is that you keep up the faith and live the faith of God's elect in the midst of this society that the Lord let us here to be salt and light. Let us shine as God wants us to shine. Amen. Well, but Seth, you didn't tell me how much time I have, so... <laughs> yes, uh, ve yes ve very, very quickly, because I don't mean to keep you. Um, regarding the prayer letter and the needs that uh, I mentioned last month, I'm just ready to write another prayer letter now. Uh, the Lord answered greatly prayers regarding our else mother-in-law. She had the surgery in uh, Vienna, in Austria. Um, in Romania, they said the cancer is unoperable. When they got to Vienna, they said the cancer is unoperable. So there was one doctor that they said, we're going to try. So not only that the cancer was operable, but he thinks that he removed the whole tumor. And right now, she doesn't need chemo. In six months, she will have to go back for a check. But there's no radiation, no chemo. The doctors were pleased and, you know, they were said, you know, they, they didn't bring God into the equation, but we know, you know, who worked things that way. Regarding Brother Constantine, uh, John's uh, brother's situation is about the same. He has tried, uh, he's suffering tremendously. I mean, he's just a new Christian. And for his wife to leave him with the two children, the two boys, she said, I'm not going to be the wife of a repenter. And that's how they nickname us. And it's really hard. So I pray that, and I ask you to pray for him too, to continue to pray. It's, he's going through a rough time right now. Uh, he tried to make contact. He tried to provide for the children because she didn't divorce him. It could be that she might already have somebody else. We don't know, but... We just pray for him. I would really appreciate it. And he, he is overwhelmed at you know, the love that he finds in, in this new family. You know? And um, I, would, I thank you for, for your prayers for him. Regarding the work, we're so thankful that the Lord is using us. He chose us to be their instruments on, on the field. We thank you and all the churches for your contributions to make the printing work and the mission trips, larger mission trips possible. Um, you already read some of the n numbers regarding the printing. It's hard for me actually to believe that three people, basically, you know, the, we were able to do that. I mean, 750,000 booklets. Out of them, actually, it's over 60,000 books, which it's a lot harder to print than just a booklet. And most of them are out. That's what we're really thankful for, because people want to, we got many, many requests. And uh, one thing that we try to do is to, to stay in touch with the people that want more, want to study. And uh, uh, so we, we make mission trips to reach those people. Usually we, we take kind of a tour uh, at least once a year. We hope to be able to do that more often. But, um, and in the near future, I'm sure that we will. Uh, but some of them are in remote places. It takes us 
sometimes 10 to 14 days to be back home on this such a mission trip around the country and we still cannot reach everyone and I plan such a trip like from half an with half an hour increments I, I know that I must leave now everyone wants you to stay more but I have to leave to get to the next point you know so we're thankful for that uh, people come to our conferences right now there are different stages of learning church truth and grace and uh, there's a high price to pay especially for church truth it's a high price for many but we're thankful that the Lord is working we will have another baptism soon uh, I was actually hoping that um, when I go back now in October the river water would not be too cold uh, to have a baptism but it's because one sister is paralyzed from waist down another brother is has a heart condition he's older and I don't want I, I wouldn't want them to send them directly to the Lord <laughs> you know after they're baptized uh, the Lord has been good with the outreach uh, regarding the mission trips we're already starting have been doing mission work outside Romania uh, we will begin, hope to be able to continue the trips to Republic of Moldova, which is eastern part of Romania. Uh, they're communists still. The communists are in power, so it's, we had really big difficulties to get literature. They, they wanted to confiscate or they just didn't want you know, that literature in their country, but eventually they, they accepted. And uh, the first time we were there, uh, the border uh, police, uh, when they saw all these boxes of literature, I said, what's this? I said, well, it's free literature. What kind of literature? Christian, Baptist literature. So he wasn't sure you know, that uh, he was going to let us in with that literature. So he tears up a box and he picks up randomly you know, one booklet and pulls it out. And he reads the title, Repent or Die, by Roscoe Brown. So he immediately puts it down and you know closes the trunk. Okay, you can go. <laughs> uh, but this time they kept actually Brother Aurel and another brother quite a long time at the border. Uh, so this is Republic of Moldova. A few years ago I went to Ukraine, but we don't have any contact right now with the people there. Uh, some of them because of the probably conflict with Russia. It's uh, in that region overtaken you know, by the pro-Russian separatists, or however they call, they're actually Russian soldiers, really. Um, I may, we make more trips to the West, to uh, Germany, to Austria, to, uh, I made the trip to Rome. I actually got a chance to uh, share the gospel, to, to speak about the gospel and church truth and grace in the house of Ignatius of Loyola, the founder of the Jesuits. Uh, with a former Catholic priest. We hope to be able to start a group which on a standby right now, you know, but we're still praying that we can start a Bible study group there in, in Rome. Not in the Vatican, <laughs> but in Rome. Uh, in Germany too, the Lord is bringing more people from Germany into uh, our reach. We make regular trips to Germany. Regarding Romania, we have uh, uh, the meeting, meetings in Boksha, in Filiash, in Bucharest, Bucharest, the capital. We, Lord willing, will start another mission point in Timisoara, which is a city north of us, about an hour north, um, among college students at first. So we already contributed renting an, an apartment there and, uh, so that we have a place to meet. Uh, it's pretty hard right now. It's three preachers in the church, four mission points, plus the printing, plus the mission trips in the country, outside the country, the conferences. Um, we were picked up by the support. This was picked up by two churches. One of them is Wasi in Ohio. And the Lord answered the great need by that. We are able to hire another brother full time in the print shop to kind of give us more freedom to our L and I as preachers to 
do more mission work and, and so it will be it's, it's like a mouth of oxygen <laughs> so we're so thankful we're overwhelmed because of that uh, so he will start in October after uh, after I go after I go back so we're looking forward to uh, the new you know printing um, you know publications and um, regarding the preaching of the gospel and sharing we believe we take the Great Commission seriously and the Great Commission says go ye and that's what we do now we're still a small church but it's amazing what a small church can do if everyone is heart everyone's heart is in it and we do it on a daily basis I mean, not everyone on a daily basis because you know people work but it's every day someone in the church is reaching out and we reached door to door with the gospel more than 110 villages uh, five towns of up to 20,000 one city of 300,000 it took the brothers in the south two years to cover door to door that city we're now in the process of covering two more and these are like systematic door to door and there are many more others that are not systematic I don't want to say random but not really you know systematic so um, we're just thankful that we are able to do this the printing is still the greatest tool that the Lord used so far the literature is traveling far and wide we're sending literature all over the world actually among Romanian speaking people mostly but we begin to print in other languages too because Europe is pretty not pretty is dark spiritually dark and we have translated materials in several European languages 11 I believe and we print in four languages we're ready to start two more uh, we print in uh, I have samples in the car I'm forgot them I wanted to show you some um, we print in Romanian in English some titles we print in German in Russian we're ready to start in Spanish in French we're pretty close to start printing so uh, that's where we are right now it doesn't mean that we don't have struggles we don't have battles we don't have attacks actually in the last two years we've been under attack attacks of the devil like seems like never before it means that we're doing something good <laughs> because and this is I want you to be encouraged um, the Lord says I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it which that teaches church perpetuity Matthew 28 teaches church succession um, oftentimes I looked at that verse and I thought well no matter how much we'll be under attack as a church the institution that Christ established will resist until he comes back which is true there was never a time and there never will be a time when there will be no scriptural churches on earth but that's kind of a defensive attitude actually the verse teaches us that we're on the offensive we are storming the gates of hell we are attacking we are invading Satan's territory and they cannot resist whenever we preach the gospel we're invading that territory and God will use that preaching the message of the gospel and he will pluck his elect from the kingdom of darkness and remove them into the kingdom of his dear son beloved son so his church, your church, our church has to be on the offensive. We are left here with a mission and the gospel is our banner. We preach the gospel because we want to glorify God. And we preach the gospel out of compassion for the lost. Never forget that. And we preach the gospel for the perpetuity of our churches. That's how, that's the means. You know, the pedo-baptists, they do mission work in one generation, and from there on, they baptize their babies, they baptize, you know, the next generation, and so on. You know, they assure their, ensure their perpetuity. You know, the true churches, they have to be mission-minded in every generation. 
Every generation, every church is one generation away from apostasy or from extinction. We have to do what the Lord left us here on earth to do in order to be obedient to Him. So, our prayers are for you as a church and for the Lord's churches here. And we want to be an encouragement to you to be faithful in doing His work because we're not defeated. We are following the conqueror. Our captain is victorious. And the gates of hell cannot resist our attack. God bless you. Amen.